Right. Right. Um, it is 7.05 we have a quorum and we have a full committee and we have our guest speaker uh, and i printed my minutes and, and here agenda it is. and i left them in the printer so thank you i even spent all the time to change the margins to get the last line on the, on the page but oh well um i would move that uh out of courtesy to expedite our visitors' return to the work family, then we jump right to which would this be under new business? Mm -hmm. yes. Second. And we can take care of our other business and our week. So Laura is Oh let me just follow through. We we have a second everybody's yes. yep. oh, so yeah, yeah. I think we followed there we go. We brought it through so go ahead. One second. Um, two, yes. and, um, Laura, can you hear us? I'm assuming you can. And do you want me to present or do you want to present? You just took yourself off mute for a second, but now you're back on mute. I'm happy to let you do it, Alexis, and I'll lurk Hello. in the background. Okay, lurk in the background, and um, I'll pause. Thank you. And of course, you do not sound well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so um, we are here, and Laura, by uh, virtual here, um, to share a little bit about Valley, I think, and um, the development that we're considering, which is purchasing the Econo Lodge on Route 9. Um, we have an existing purchase and sale agreement, and we are set to take ownership, hopefully in early January, everything goes well. Um, but we are really like wanting to talk to the community and have folks sort of understand why, <laughs> why we're doing this, um, what we're hoping to accomplish, um, so I, the, I have to admit that this is Laura's presentation, um, but I know the development well enough to be able to walk through it, um, and she will uh, correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, and if, and, I don't know if it takes any pressure off of you, if yeah. I didn't have um, I'm also on the planning board, so she has presented. You've heard, so yeah. I've, I've, right. yeah. So it's not new to me, but I don't know if any of you. It's new to me. No, yeah. You didn't all watch the planning board? Okay. Go ahead. The <laughs> floor is yours. really riveting. <laughs> uh, after the fact review. Yeah. Um, and since you're such a small group, I like just please interrupt me. Like I, I, I don't feel like this is a formal presentation. Um, so let me get these slides to cooperate with me here. Since we're only seeing, oh yes, we do yeah. see more now. Yeah. Um, so this is a quick sort of overview. Some of us, I'm sure you all know because you live here, mm -hmm. um, have is a relatively small community with about 5,000 people, um, about half of that in housing. Most of the housing here is single family. There's not a lot of duplexes, triplexes, multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. um, and almost 80% of it is owner occupied. So there's not a ton of renters. Um, of that remaining you know, 23% or so, um, 54 of that 23% are cost burden, which means that people are paying more than 30% of their income towards their housing costs. Um, that is sort of the, the golden standard when mm -hmm. looking at affordability is 30% of your income, and that's your gross income, mm -hmm. um, generally speaking. So this is a quick overview, which you also probably already know, um, that Hadley is in some areas a little bit more diverse than Hampshire County as a whole, um, but overall, you know, most of Hampshire County in totality is less diverse than the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, mm. Hampshire County is less diverse than Hampton, but more diverse than Franklin, right? So we're trying to just like see where we are in our framework of space here. Um, and then considering about uh, different races and incomes, we know that um, people with lower incomes obviously have a tendency to be more rent burdened, right? So you don't make as much money. So paying whatever little money you have towards rent is sort of a, it's a higher lift. Um, and we know that people of color have lower incomes than white people um, in the state. So 
just two years ago when this last survey was done, uh, black households earned just 62 cents for every dollar that a white household earned. Um, and that a quarter of Latinos and almost a quarter of blacks in Massachusetts live below the poverty line compared to just 6% of white folks. Um, so that is thinking in like sort of the larger picture of like why is affordable housing important and why is affordable housing important as a diversity and equity issue. Mm -hmm. So now we're zooming back out a little bit to Hampshire County that 83% of renter households earned under $20,000 mm -hmm. and they are rent burdened and obviously those numbers go up if we look at Hispanic folks and Asians, um, and then even for white folks that 15% of people earning that much or that little are rent burdened. Um, so do people know about the point in time counts? Has anybody heard that term? No. Um, it came around years and years and years ago, but every um, continuum of care, of which there's a three county continuum of care, which is how, um, social service agencies and some housing providers interact with the homeless population. Um, so there was this movement a long time ago, 20 years or so, where um, people really started to understand that like homelessness wasn't the problem, like there's all sorts of other causes around it. And so if you're trying to connect, if you're trying to move someone out of homelessness, you need like support services around them. So the continuum of care is like trying to integrate support services and housing um, into one sort of coordinated point. Part of that, there comes funding with it. Part of the requirement for funding is that every year, um, groups of people go out and count how many homeless people they are. And it's called the point in time count because they do it on one night. Um, it's typically sometime in the winter. Um, I don't remember where, when Hampshire County does it, but I think it's like February-ish. Um, so the 2022 Hampshire County point in time um, showed that there were 176 individuals and 60 families that were homeless, um, and 214 of those folks were living in shelters. The remainder were unsheltered, so folks out on the streets. Um, yeah, it's a lot. And there's been there's been a couple of more, even more recent studies that have looked at point in time counts sort of as a whole, particularly post COVID, um, that they're just way under counting people because to get, particularly in larger cities, right, to get the number of people out on the streets to count every single homeless person and find where they are yeah, right. uh, and count them, you're missing people. Um, so even in Hampshire County, I know um, near where our, our office is, there is some homeless encampment with folks, folks living in tents. I'm sure there's people back in the woods that you don't even maybe know about or people don't see. So I would take this number with a grain of salt, it's probably higher. Um, and so then if you're looking at the popula the homeless population as a whole, again, in Hampshire County, um, the disparities for people of color are higher. So black homeless is 5.3 times greater than that of the general population. Hispanic families are 13 times greater than that of the general population. Again, going back to, um, you know, <laughs> history of racism and redlining and lack of access to loans. And I mean, you guys, mm -hmm. I'm sure know mm -hmm. all of the history behind us, but, um, it, again, is sort of why affordable housing, um, even in communities that tend to be more predominantly white, can actually help work towards addressing DEI issues. Um, so shifting a little bit to Valley, so Valley Community Development, um, as you may or may not know, uh, we've been a nonprofit in Hampshire County for a little over 30 years now, 34, I think. Um, we sort of have three tiers that we work on. Um, we do affordable housing development and ownership, primarily rentals, but not always. Um, we do first time home buyer support and pre and purchase, pre and post purchase counseling, foreclosure prevention, and then we do economic development. And what that looks like is support for small business owners, um, particularly people that come from underserved communities. Um, since we're talking about housing, we're talking about, yeah, please. Can you talk a little bit about support for business owners? Sure. Um, so we have a small business program. We're funded by the state of Massachusetts through this um, granting program called uh, Mass, Mass Growth Capital Corporation. Um, that's our primary source of funding. We get some cities and towns give us money as well to support small businesses. Um, and it is one-to-one -one counseling with business owners, 
We offer workshops. Um, we do business planning, marketing support for businesses that are just starting up. Maybe they have their rental space and they figured out what they're going to sell, but they haven't formed an LLC yet. We'll sometimes help people connect with lawyers or cover legal costs. We'll help people set up their accounting systems, so QuickBooks. It's all free. How does this connect with the house? So it's, well, it's all part of Valley's mission. So Valley Community Development as an organization has three pieces of work that we do. Well, and I just wanted to people, in, yeah. That ties into what you said before that can't fix homelessness just by putting a roof over your head. There's a yeah. bigger package. Yeah. 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 So when I think Valley was, and this is when Joanne would be really useful, when Valley was created a long time ago, it was really looking at um, economic development and affordable housing development. And the economic, they don't, they have to go together. Like to have sure. a vibrant and sure. by, like vibrant community for people to live in. You can't just have housing and you can't just have businesses. You need to have both and you need to have places for people to work. Um, and in Hampshire County and Northampton and Amherst and East Hampton, um, you know, there's such a big support for small business owners, like mom and pop shops, like that is what makes people, like the place feel vibrant and thriving. Um, so Valley has had a longstanding commitment to supporting, supporting small businesses. So small businesses and homeless people, what's the third element? Home ownership support. So some of the intent is that if you get, you know, way down the line, get people stabilized in rental housing, they're not paying, you know, they're managing their income. We do financial counseling with people. We help people figure out how to pay down debt. Maybe at some point they then are able to become first home buyers, mm -hmm. um, which as folks probably know, like home ownership is one of the biggest ways to earn and gain equity and then transfer that equity on to the next generation within your family. And it's been something that has not been accessible mm -hmm. to folks of color for a really long time, particularly not at the same level as been accessible to other people. Mm -hmm. um, so just backtracking a little bit, um, Valley currently owns rental properties in Northampton and Amherst. Across um, six properties, we have 81 units. And it's a mixture of family housing, so two bedroom, three bedroom. Mm -hmm and single room efficiencies. Um, some of the buildings we currently own are have a prioritization for folks coming out of homelessness. Um, and we've been serving that population for over two decades. So you're a nonprofit. We are. How do you afford by you know, are you fundraisers do you get grants from the yeah. we do all of those uh, things <laughs> big sale. sale no thankfully not yeah. no big sales um so there's a couple of funding mechanisms um we have and I, if you're thinking sorry about to get you off track oh no it's, I, I don't mind at all um so if we're thinking about like large properties and acquisition so i'm gonna i'll go to the econo lodge um, right now, we've been approved by CDAC, which is the Community Economic Development Assistance Corporation, state agency, um, for a $4.2 million acquisition. So it is a, it's a loan from them. Um, depending on the, they pull in different sources of funding to cobble together that amount of money. So depending on what sources of funding they're pulling in, we're actually hoping that some of that $4 million plus is ARPA funding. That makes our interest rate change. Um, so if it's, you know, depending on how much ARPA money comes in, that would, there would be no interest attached to that. Some, some funding sources are 5%, some are 7%. So we often have these variable loans that are packaged into the overall acquisition. Um, for much larger developments, um, folks may have seen in the news that Valley bought the old nursing home in Northampton that's been abandoned for 12 years. Um, and we're going to redevelop that into 60 units of housing. That is going to be a $25 million development. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of sources of funding that are coming in. And some are zero interest. Some we never have to pay back. Some we do have to pay back. Some are different interest rates. So you're with that amount of money that you're talking, it's never coming from one source. <clears throat> are you going to buy the much um, yeah. That's the plan, yeah. <laughs> and then when they pay their affordable rents, is that your revenue then? That it's, then goes back to pay off those loans? It will pay off the loans and help sustain operations, right? So we, one of the important pieces um, that communities often ask us, which you may have heard already, is if you're a nonprofit, then do you not pay taxes? Do you not pay property taxes? Like what is the town gonna lose by you buying mm -hmm. this? So 
all of the developments that we have become disregarded entities throughout, they become limited liability corporations. So they are all taxed. Um, it's unfortunate from my perspective because I look at our ongoing operations once the project's done. Um, and you know, it costs us money. <laughs> we pay all, very similar property taxes to what anybody else would pay. Um, so there's no tax loss okay. um, with this development. Um, I'm just gonna go on to the next one. So we're yeah, curiosity, please. when you buy the motel, mm -hmm. when you pay taxes, the same kind of taxes that the business pay, or will you get a different purchasing or on the um, I think that'll be a different rate because it's a different use. So part right. of what we are waiting for the planning board on um is a a 40B. So it's a different type of zoning. Um, so I think it will, Laura, you can yell at me if I'm getting yeah. Can, can you hear me? So we've, we've talked a lot about real estate taxes for this particular property. Um, the short answer is we'll pay property taxes according to the assessed value. Um, and they'll assess the value as basically a commercial rental property versus a hotel property. Um, but we'll pay whatever that assessed fair market assessed value is in property taxes. Uh, we will not pay lodging taxes. Um, so that is a difference with our use versus the hotel use. It's also a difference with, I think it's the Howard Johnson's that's now being converted to a business park. Anytime, you know, there are specific taxes sometimes for specific uses. Um, but I think the big takeaway is that we'll be paying according to the assessed value of the property. Yeah. Does that help? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. great. Thanks, Laura. And, um, and yeah. when you get occupants for that <clears throat> do they have like month by month leases or nope so it'll be an annual lease annual lease yep so this is what um so it's not that transient it's, you know. right so what we're developing what the proposed development is is permanent supported housing which means um there's essentially if you're thinking about like folks coming out of homelessness what are their options mm -hmm. shelter which is day by day. You, there's no tenancy there. You don't right. sign a lease. Right. There's um, you can't leave your clothes there. You, you know. can't leave your clothes there, right? It's yeah. it's not your space. Yeah. <laughs> so there's transitional housing, which really <laughs> depends on who's running it and what it looks like. It can be three months. It can be six months. It can be nine months. Generally, it's less than a year. So it's your space, but the expectation is you're going to move on. And then there's permanent housing or permanent supported housing, which you are a tenant. Just like anybody else, you sign annual leases. Um, depending on which unit um, you're tied to, there's different subsidies that are required and different income levels. And so people generally have to qualify every year. You do an income recertification um, to make sure you're still within the income guidelines for the unit. So if your plan works as you have it, oh, they graduate out. They get on their feet yeah, and, and then they for someone else to... to it really depends. So one of the things that I found interesting about um, housing and about people coming out of homelessness um, is that some of our properties that we own, um, there's a property that we own on King Street in Northampton that has small little single room efficiencies. We have tenants that have been there for 11 and 12 years. Um, because it's what works for them. They've stabilized. They don't want something bigger. Like they have their community there. They're really close to whatever, you know, the grocery store, where their friends are, like where they like to hang out. Um, that actually, that was surprising to me because I, you know, I went in there and was like, these are so small. <laughs> um, but for some folks, it works. So it isn't, it isn't necessarily like, oh, you know, it's going to be 50 units and then we inspect. 20 of them to turn over every year. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't necessarily the expectation. Mm -hmm. And it, it really depends on the people. Right. Right. Um, so right. getting in, yeah, getting into the scope of work. So as I just mentioned, um, it's going to be 50 units. Right now it's 63. So we're going to reduce density. Um, and we're going to take some of the current sort of studio-ish apartments and make them into one bedrooms. We're going to keep some of them as they are, but we're going to add kitchens. So they are all going to have kitchens. Which property is this? This is the Econo Lodge. In Hadley? Yeah. Yes. In front of, you know, right in back of me. Yeah. It's, it's next to 
Four Seasons on Right. Yeah, yeah, it's this one here. There's the front of it. And I don't know if you can tell from this little map here. Straight in front of the mall. Yeah, yeah Whole Foods is here. Panera is here. The Kana Lodge is right here. A great yeah. place for a mall worker. So, so that's, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe even the next one. Okay, so I just said we're gonna we're gonna decrease the density. Um, Twenty five of the apartments will be for folks that are very low income, which is um, thirty percent or below of the area median income. Twenty five for people people of moderate income, which is sixty percent of the area median income. What do those numbers mean? You ask. Here you go. So thirty percent of the area median income means that someone's earning nineteen thousand. To change a year. 60% is just under 40 a year. Um, and for a point of reference, a single person working full time at minimum wage in Massachusetts right now earns just over $29,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, so you're above, you know, above the abject poverty line, but still <laughs> yeah. uh, not really uh, living the dream. Living the dream. Definitely not living the dream. Um, and so for a, a frame of reference here, 30% of that person's income, if you were making minimum wage working full time, you would pay $740 a month for rent um, mm -hmm. in your utilities, which will require the include rent. Um, so in terms of what we're thinking about. It should still be 40% of the income if you that. Um, so it's capped at 30. So if it, okay. if they make less, they okay. don't, they pay less. Okay. It's okay. there. You look at their gross income and they're always going to pay 30%. Okay. Um, so the on-site staff we're planning on having will be a live-in property manager, um, a resident service coordinator. So that term is sort of a social service -y term. It essentially means someone who can act as a liaison between folks living in the building um, and case management, um, educational services, like you need a van to get you somewhere and you're in a wheelchair. Like they're someone who's connected in the social service world, but they aren't necessarily like they're not an LICSW, um, but they often are very well tapped into what the like social service network is. And um, and it might be shared between your different properties. This one, I think Laura has, um, we budgeted to have someone, one person on site just for this property. Okay. Um, so the property manager, maintenance staff, and then an on call overnight um, crisis service provider. So there are three resident managers. Yep, but one is live in, the other two will just have offices. Yep. Um, and then this is getting back to, as I already talked about, sort of what supportive housing means. It's like, it has been framed as wraparound services. So like, what are all the things that somebody who might um, have some challenges in their life need um, to be able to thrive and survive mm -hmm. in housing? I mean, that the goal always is um, stable tenancy. So when we talk about um, what like success looks like in Valley, in our own housing that we run, people stay in housing for more than a year when they come out of homelessness. We have a low vacancy rate. We don't evict people. Like what can we do to make sure that people have stability when they're in housing? Um, and we have a tentative partnership agreement with CSO, Clinical and Support Options. They're a big case manager in um, here and in Hamden County. They have recently taken over the contract to provide the homeless shelters in Northampton. They'll start that in April. CSO. CSO. Yeah. Clinical yeah. and support options. Right the bottom line. Yeah. They do case management services. Um, they have extensive experience working with people currently in homelessness homelessness and people wanting to come out of homelessness. Um, Laura has worked on a they're doing their own development. Um, in Springfield, where they're building housing for folks coming out of homelessness that will be permanent supported housing. Laura's worked on that with them. So we know them pretty well, and um, they sort of are the best game in town when it comes to case management services, at least that we found. 
Yeah, so this is very comprehensive yeah. um, philosophy. Uh -huh. yeah. So <laughs> and very um, detailed. Where does it come from? Mm. Oh goodness! I mean, it just gen in general, not specific. Yeah, I mean, it, it came out of like people like the homeless crisis, really, okay. in the like late eighties, heading into the early nineties. And there were a bunch of housing advocates um, who were working with case managers who were like, this is not working. Like they right. knew that just keeping people in shelter didn't work. Kicking people out of shelter because maybe they were drinking or using drugs didn't work. Like what, like, what could you do to actually get people to have success in housing? Um, so they, I think there was a big study that was done um, on the development in New York by this guy, Dennis Colhane, in like 1993, um, about this like really housing first model about like people need stable housing and all the services wrapped around them. And that's when you start to see success. Yeah. Um, so very briefly looking at our proposed timeline and uh, as Laura always likes to say, this is the absolute best, best case. Like yeah. everything goes perfectly, yeah. um, which uh, literally almost never happens. <laughs> um, so as I said, we've already received our financing loan for the acquisition. Um, that was from CDAC, from the Community and Economic Development Assistance Consortium, uh, Massachusetts, uh, non like quasi governmental. Um, we by the Econo Lodge in January. Um, we'd have zoning hearings and review with the town through March. We'd hope for a zoning decision from the town at the end of March. Once we get the zoning decision, we can apply for state financing. Um, this would be for construction. Um, we hope to receive the financing commitment in June. We do the renovations. And this is a really short timeline for renovations because mm. as you may or may not know, the building's in great shape. Um, it has a relatively new roof. There was a bunch of new flooring put in, mini splits were put in in the past two or three years. Like unlike mm. some of our other developments where the nursing home in Northampton, for example, that's like that rehab or ones that we're building from the ground up. Um, this is fast and it's good because it's not particularly expensive and we're inheriting and we're buying something that's in really pretty solid shape um, and then we'd look to hopefully lease up start moving people in um we lease up april to july and have people move in towards the end of july of 2024 so a little bit less than two years from now um so the one more flag and then i'll stop talking because i know i've been talking for a really long time and i apologize um this is a sort of big deal for us about local preference and it's something that's been flagged already by the town um and i don't know if folks have heard of this term before or what it means but essentially towns in massachusetts um can request up to 60 percent local preference for affordable housing developments um this became a really big thing in the development that we were we're not, that's under construction right now in Amherst, um, but the town of Amherst insisted on local preference and we weren't particularly thrilled about it. And I'm gonna tell you why, because a bunch of recent studies have shown that local preference in majority white communities, which going back to what we shared about the demographics of Hadley and Hampshire County, um, leads to increased white tendencies and sort of reinforces patterns of housing discrimination. Can you define local preference as a term? Yes, so local preference means that only people from the town where you are doing your development in. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. That up to 70%, <laughs> which is the cap that the state puts. Um, the town can request that 70% of the applicants are from the town you're can the town say we like local preference for thirty percent? Yes, absolutely. But no one does. <laughs> we well, haven't. This, this could be a first. This is um. Yeah, Laura, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I w I wanted to expand on the definition of local preference. So it's someone who's currently living, in this case, in Hadley, who's working in Hadley who works for the Hadley town government or who has kids in the Hadley schools. So it's a very regulated definition by the state um, as part of the 40B, which is a 
a permitting process through the ZBA. The ZBA and the developer can kind of negotiate terms. Um, and the ZBA can request up to 70% local preference from the state. It has to be approved by the state. Um, but municipalities uh, seem to seem to enjoy or, or like the idea of giving preference to their own residents. Um, given the nature of this committee, we just wanted to bring it to your attention that there is a pattern evolving. Um, when you use local preference in majority white communities of kind of perpetuating and maybe limiting the potential diversity. Um, earlier in the slides that Alexis was showing, I think it was 57% of Valley's current tenants in our properties in Northampton and Amherst are people of color. And so that's a very different level of diversity than just in Northampton or just in Amherst or just in Hadley. So it's, again, it's that real overlap of income and race um, and color that we're, we're kind of wanting to focus on with you folks here today. Thanks, Laura. Mm, thank you. Um, so this, the studies that I just mentioned that have really sort of highlighted this, this is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and this looks at local preference. Um, and the left-hand side is the total applicants that applied for affordable housing. So there's 1,157. Um, and the right-hand side is who actually got in. So if you see the bottom is the 14% the on the left-hand side is white folks. The bottom on the right side is 44%. So 14% of the total applicant pool was white, but 44% of the tenants ended up being white. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, they really directly correlated it to local preference being in place. Um, so this is becoming um, a thing for Valley as a whole. My board is flagging this as we start to really pay more attention to DEI issues as an organization. Um, and thinking through like, if we're building affordable housing and we want it to be equitable for everyone, how does local preference come into play with that? Um, and as communities are allowed to do it, most communities do do it, um, but particularly for this committee, we wanted to just bring it up in case you didn't know about its existence. Um, and it has been unfortunately shown to really skew who actually is able to access affordable housing. What is it? Is there a way to say, you know, let's sort that first graph on the left and accept people in the same proportions? Mm -hmm. There is, um, this is Laura, you might need to chime in because you know about lottery a lot better than I do. Sure. Uh, when we use public money, we have to do an, uh, basically a lottery system um, and they require the lottery Pool, the local preference pool to be balanced. And so you balance the, the kind of percentage of minority persons in your statistical area um, into that local preference pool. But even after doing that balancing, the outcomes still favor local white applicants. So this chart was a compilation of three different um, lotteries for three different affordable housing projects that all had local preference. So that balancing that is being done to address the racial inequalities doesn't seem to be having the impact that that we might all want it to. So we need to find a better way to balance that. And how, how, between the asking and the giving, what process could change those numbers? Right, as a, you know, Laura, you can jump in too, but I think the, the big piece the piece that seems to make the difference is requiring local preference in communities that are majority white. Um, it was an interesting conversation we had about this as housing developers and housing providers with other groups across the state who do this similar work. And there was someone outside of Boston who works in the communities of Chelsea and Everett who was like, well, local preference works for us because our community is being gentrified. And if we don't use local preference, we actually will decrease the diversity. Mm -hmm. So it is a little bit case by case, mm -hmm. um, but out here, given our current demographics that we skew white um, and all of the communities in Hampshire County and majority white that um, local preference seems to work against diversity. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you want to chime in? 
Yeah. So the only takeaway, the solution is to have the town not require local preference or to require it to a lower percentage. And um, we know that the select board is already in their initial letter of support has already stated that Hadley wants local preference for the Econolodge development. And the last thing we wanna do is pit this committee against another committee in town, because that doesn't work well, but we do wanna bring information and education to the different boards so that, because I don't think people understand or realize potentially the racial impact of um, requiring local preference. So we just wanted to kind of have that conversation here with this committee. We need to find local preference a little more. Yeah, I have a question too. Well, Could I add to that too? That what I'm trying to figure out is if this is low income housing, local preference implies to me people that already live here. So they already have housing. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, I'm not it's getting it. So no. Go so, yeah. here or they live here. So local preference is someone who there are four, four characteristics that you can have to qualify for local preference. You reside in a town, which might mean you're living in housing that's unaffordable to you or in a shelter mm -hmm. or doubled up with your family members or in a building that's condemned. It doesn't mean you have adequate housing. So yeah. you are a resident in a community, you work in a community and here's, here's, something that I think is very relevant to Hadley. Hadley has a very large kind of service sector, Route 9 business going on. And mm -hmm. I theorize that most of those employees um, at entry level are not able to afford to live in Hadley. So those folks who are working in town would potentially qualify at, for local preference. People who work for the town government and people who have children in the school system. So if you live in one place and you school choice your kids into a different school district, it would qualify for you, you for local preference in that community. So those are the four definitions of local preference. Okay. So I, yeah, so it's or, if all those four things are this or this or this. Or yeah. Correct, yeah. Oh, correct. Yeah. Was, you, you don't have to I, have them all. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad to hear that. I, I own a business in Hadley and I've yep. never had an employee be able to afford to live here and work for me. Exactly. So when we were thinking about the, white. when I we were only white applicants. When we were thinking about the Econo Lodge and and what would be the best use there, you know, we knew there's a crisis in people who are homeless needing housing. And I've heard some people say there aren't any homeless people in Hadley, but I don't think it's accurate. Um there have been encampments out behind the shopping malls and places like that. So, but then we looked at the need for basically worker housing right in that Route 9 corridor and thought people were having, businesses were having such a hard time hiring entry level workers. Um, if you live at the Econo Lodge, you can walk to many potential places of employment. And so that's a win for the employee who now doesn't have to commute into town. And it's a win for the employers because they're able to attract and retra retain some, um, some reliable employees who live nearby. Yeah, especially in that's big. two or three years, we'll have the new Route 9 with yeah. the oh, with walking, that. biking mm -hmm. route and all that. Yeah. yeah, it's a great location for people who are maybe so low income that they don't have their own vehicle. Um, I'm sure you know that there's a major bus route. It's the most active bus route in Hampshire County, goes right down Route 9. There's a bus stop literally in front of the Econo Lodge. <laughs> um, there, the bike trail goes behind the mall, so that's easy access. Um, so it's yeah. very, yeah, you can walk to shopping, you can walk, you know, I mean, it, it's a great location for someone who doesn't have a car. And that yeah. at least half sure. our tenants don't have cars. It's the Econ Lodge right in front of the shopping mall. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not the one in the Yours is the house. No, no. I was going to say, it can't possibly be near where you live. Is, no, not <laughs> the, the one across from Hadley County Practice. No, no. Correct. This is one. This is oh, yeah. This one is right, right smack in front of yeah. Whole Foods. Right next to. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's either it's adjacent to Four Seasons or Jimmy Lube or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. What used to be the new mall. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> oh, it's in, it's in front of the it's in front of the dead mall. Do you folks remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the dead mall is now the new. Yeah. <laughs> some, some one in oh back my back gosh. Back. Also, uh, for this. Oh, that I don't know. Uh, if you lived here since the 70s. I, I grew up in the area. I remember when the malls were built. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. I remember too. It's now. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty yeah. busy now. Aren't there, um, aren't there numbers that we could harvest that would say this is what you know we believe is out there? Uh, applicants that would fit those local preferences. I mean, isn't there an argument to say you know if we had you know, estimated 70 people that could do that, and you have historically of those 30% want to go into, you know, so then we could say, all right, so or let's say there's 50 people that met that and three. So we could say, you know, let's reserve 25% or something like that for, um, even if, yeah, because it seems like, I mean, is there a mechanism to get that number? It seems, it seems like it should be a harvestable number, but I, I mean, it's, to, to prove that we don't need 70%, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the, it's the opposite argument. The state requires a city or town to prove that it does need 70%. The presumption is we, under fair housing, all of the housing that we work on, and the Connell Lodge is no exception, are primarily funded with state and federal funds. They're not gonna be funded by the town of Hadley. And so the money is coming from a broad public base and the presumption is it should serve a broad public base that folks who want to move to Hadley should be able to, people who live in Hadley who want to move somewhere else should also be able to. So if other communities have local preference, then residents of Hadley are limited in where they can live. Um, so it's the, the, the city or town needs to make a case using demographic data to the state before being allowed to you to have a local preference. Okay, cool. I'm just trying to think of, you know, an argument for why they would want to ask for the full amount. I mean, because if we didn't have local preference, would there be local people that said, I didn't get in there? I mean, that could happen, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. We don't have, unless Laura knows otherwise, the only thing we know is that local preference has been floated as something that they want, mm -hmm. not the percentage. I wonder if they, the um, town. I, I wonder um, if they fully understand the intent. I mean, yeah. the, the yeah, I, I don't think they do. I think this is fairly new information, even for us, to that the studies on this are are just coming to light, really. Because when I first heard you bring up the term, I'm like, yeah, yeah buy local, local. Yeah. you know. <laughs> I right. yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no, this is counterintuitive. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if you think about how how segregated our communities are, I mean, Hampshire and Hamden County, Western Mass is, is one of the most segregated areas in the country in terms of where Latinos live. So how do you get those patterns? And 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 if you think about giving a preference to people who already live in a community that's almost all white, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> It'll continue to be almost all white. So again, it's, this is for all of us, this is a, this is an area of learning um, about the fact that things that sounded good to us and were maybe kind of second nature to give preference to our neighbors um, have maybe inadvertently created these patterns of racial segregation. Maybe this is down the road, but is there something we can do about this as a committee? We well, as Laura brought up, you know, we want to be really <laughs> clear that we don't want this committee to pit itself against our um, parent committee. Correct. The, the slight board. Yeah. yeah. No, as but I, th I think it's about education. So yeah. there yeah. could yeah. be, yeah. it could be when we get into the zoning um, board process, we might let this committee know. And maybe someone can come from the committee and just speak on this issue and say, you know, here's what we learned. Here's why we think we need to think carefully about local preference. You know, right. here are some counter arguments that people might not have thought of about racial segregation. I think we want to use a light touch um, with all of the boards that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is, you know, we are the supplicants when it comes to the zoning board and the select board. Um, we want to work together with those boards. 
um, I think it's during the conversation with the zoning board that we may call upon folks from this committee and other people in town to just kind of articulate some of these ideas. Um, it's more powerful that comes from you as residents of Hadley than from us as the, you know, the developer. Yeah. That was sort of my question. Is there a role for people yeah. in Hadley to yeah. play yeah. 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 like us? Yeah. yeah, I think definitely. I mean, isn't our mission statement that we're supposed to advise the select board yeah. on issues of diversity? I mean, that's exactly what this is. And as Laura said, and as you pointed out, it is, it's a little counterintuitive, particularly I feel like in Mm -hmm. Farming communities where people are like, oh, of course I want to help my neighbor. Yeah. Like this is children that live here. Right, around. right, yeah. right. So I don't, I don't think that there's malice behind it. I think there's we just, as Laura said, oh, yeah, this right. this level of data about the actual impact of local preference is pretty new. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Well, we have to really make the piece. case for the value for everyone yeah. to have more diversity. Mm -hmm. right. And I do think there are residents in our town that don't of course what's what's the point you know we could use that quote that we all were talking about that shows in the paper spots about what that means yeah. Yeah. i just want to ask about the criteria for securing mm -hmm. one of these units and you mentioned the support of the wraparound mm -hmm. services does it does an applicant need to demonstrate a need for any of those services no nor are they required to nor, them. nor are they required mm -hmm. okay so so any person with economic need correct um, can apply and so i would imagine that that there are um a number of hadley residents who have family members or friends who would qualify who would meet the criteria mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so it's not the other services, even though the the housing provides more than mm -hmm. um, just a place to live. Right. Who decides who's accepted? So the Laura, you can jump in too, but um, we're required to do a lottery because we're required to adhere to fair housing standards, um, and we Valley uses a third party property management company called um, Housing Management Resources (HMR). They're a statewide company, but they have an office in Florence and an office in Turner's Falls and an office in Pittsfield. Um, so we work very closely with the Florence-based staff. So you pre-qualify them and then they get into a lobby? Right. Yeah. Mm. We're also required to do affirmative marketing. So um, pretty aggressively. So there's there, we have to be intentional about trying to reach the people for geographic or linguistic or economic barriers who might not know about the opportunity. So we do a lot of outreach to, you know, different areas. We do a lot of outreach through the various social service providers, the local shelters. I mean, one of the pernicious things about not having a permanent address it just makes it harder to know when things are happening and to get paperwork and to fill out paperwork and get calls back. Um, so if we have 25, about half the units that have a homeless preference, then we'll be working really hard with people who are directly in touch with people who have no housing so that they will know about the opportunity and be able to apply. And they will in fact have preference for those units. The other half of the units will be pretty much based on income, income eligibility. Um, and then it's a it's like a bingo situation. We get a big spinner and we pull people's names out and, and we make a big list. Um, when we leased up a property in Northampton a few years ago that had 31 very small apartments, just like these little studios, um, we had 250 applicants for those 31 apartments. So, and we would expect the same thing here, that the need is so outpacing the supply um, that we do everything we can to make sure everybody who's qualified knows about the opportunity and that it's a fair selection process. For our current housing, um, for the one bedrooms, we have like an 11 or 1200 person waiting list. Granted, not all those folks may qualify, but that is the, that's the need, um, so. 
opportunities like this where it's a relatively short turnaround time, it's not the five to seven years we're seeing <laughs> some of our other developments, where there's not a lot of work that needs to happen to get it um, move in ready for folks, we are we're excited to seize. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be hard to argue that there's no need for this. Correct. One could <laughs> argue that point. I don't think one could argue that That's point. Okay. Yes. It's a ship that won't float. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so will it like half of them are prioritized towards the so thirty percent of the yeah folks AMI. coming out of homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, the so, so how many of these units would be would count towards uh, affordable housing and for how long is this in perpetuity or? it's in perpetuity yeah. um so most of the financing that we received or correct me if i'm wrong but also um affordability deeds there's certain they're varying periods 15 30 99 tend to be the most common ones laura since this is a tax credit deal does that change anything you know, it's again, it's a point that can get negotiated with the Zoning Board of Appeals. We understand Hadley is the Hadley Planning Board is a savvy bunch and they're 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 wanting a 99 year restriction, which is typical for Valley. I mean, we're not doing this for the short run. This is the mission of what we do. We don't want to do it and then stop doing it. Um, so we are amenable to signing on to a 99 year deed restriction. So all of these units are affordable. All of them would qualify on the state subsidized housing inventory. Um, and we would be willing to restrict them in perpetuity, which is what people say when they say 99 years. There's another argument for the town to say this keeps us above the state mandated mm -hmm. number so that we can only have to mm -hmm. worry about friendly 40 days. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people who have a section eight housing Get, do they qualify for this? I would think. So there's two two types of Section Eights. Um, we'll be applying for some that will be project based that will stay with the individual apartments at the Econo Lodge, and then individuals might have what's called a mobile Section Eight, where they can rent anywhere they would like that will take them and pay thirty percent of their income for rent. We have a huge problem in the Valley. East Hampton, North Hampton, Amherst, Hadley, in that the fair market rents that people are allowed to pay with their mobile vouchers are well below the actual market rents. So even when you get a mobile voucher, you still can't live in Hadley because there's no place to rent that will take your voucher. Not only is there limited apartments, but the apartments that are here are more expensive then you can pay with your mobile voucher. So it further limits the potential diversity um, and equity of our housing ecosystem. We have heard what I find to be very sad cases of folks, because there's quite a wait list to get a mobile voucher. Um, oh, yeah. Folks getting finally getting one after being on the wait list and then having to turn it back because they couldn't find a place to Can't it. find anywhere to live. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's nationally a problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But is it worse here? Yeah. I mean, Massachusetts is one of the most expensive states <laughs> in the country. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of rent, I think we typically are mm -hmm. somewhere in the top three between behind California and New York. So, and the fair market rents for Hadley are set based on the Springfield uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. So that loops in all of Hamden County. So, for example, the fair market rent for a studio apartment, I think it just went up. It was $737. Now it might be $824. And that's that's rent and utilities. You cannot find an apartment, a studio apartment, in our region for that rent. They're $1,200, $1,300. My daughter has the tiniest little efficiency in Amherst. Mm -hmm. It's 1000 Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a mobile voucher, the max that a landlord can charge you is set. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that's why people can't find places because they can't, the voucher will not pay more than the $824. Mm -hmm. So if someone's charging you a thousand, you can't go there with your voucher. So it, it won't pay more than, it, I think it doesn't we, it pay 30%? We, so you pay 30%? But right. the max rent that a Got landlord it. can charge you okay. is set by the fair market rents. Right. 
And we're totally in the same, it. Hampshire County is the same as Springfield. <clears throat> Gotta change their sets. Yeah, well, that's kind of, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> I was trying to get them to update for the Northampton yeah. vicinity because it's that's, just not I mean, the I, same as. I have an employee right now who can't find a place to live. She has to move. I can't find anywhere to live. She lives in Chicopee right now. Right. Certainly, I certainly mean, if. Like, if you do any kind of service work in our region, you can't afford to live here. And I mean, every every time I go to get my hair cut, I always ask the person, hey, you know, where do you live? Do you live in, in Northampton where I get my hair cut? And almost inevitably, they're commuting. They have a car, they're paying gas, they're commuting from somewhere in Hampton County to come up and cut my hair in Northampton. It's kind of a sorry state of affairs. <laughs> I've noticed the same thing. I'll ask bank tellers. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I'll ask people if they are people of color. I'll say, oh, you know, you have family. I like, and, and they never live here. Yeah. Never. All right, folks. Thank you. You're so much. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Laura, for thank you. Yeah, thank rising you, Laura. from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You notice I'm not putting myself on camera. <laughs> think of that hot but tea, it's yeah. nice. You can yeah. Still yeah. So yeah. So you know how to get a hold of us? Please ask questions. Um, if we come up with more research around local preference, we'll certainly share it. Um, and if you think of anything that we can do as a community yeah. that would help your efforts, please let us know. Thank you so much. LB and you would be A. AB. AB. And if you would share your slides with me, of course, that yeah. would be helpful oh, to me to yeah. have notes. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I'll share yes. them if that's yes. okay. Oh, of course. Statistics. There's a lot of good information. Like if we were going to compose a letter to the zoning or the planning or the yeah. select board, it would be helpful to have those numbers to cite. Absolutely. I can send the whole study to you if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's a really good point that you have all those other services because. Yeah. I've just noticed some people get worried, low income, and they think there's going to be all these problems. Of course. It's not that there won't be. Exactly. But they're doing everything they can to support them. Right. I'm going to rush things, but I'm not going to be able to stay much longer if you're going to get on for my No, Fair enough. we should let right. the same Thank thing. you so much. Oh, of course, you're so welcome. Yeah. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. This is real stuff. Thank you Amazing. for having me. <laughs> Amazing the work that you've done. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's not it's Laura, really, not me. <laughs> it's a team the, effort now. I just keep the ship sailing. How's that? Yeah, the organization, yeah. The organization has done a good work. Well, the sailing is important. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, thank you, folks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, it is. Okay. Hi, Laura. And I think you have to go out the door in that corner. Okay, thank you. Across the I think she's dining room. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang around. I love to stay. I love to hear public meetings. So I'm just gonna sit in the yeah. background here. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, you might hear some things you don't want to, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave early in the morning to go to Boston. Oh. Okay. So when do you want to go? Fifteen minutes or any time? Yeah. Basically. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so thank you again to Valley CDC, mm -hmm. uh, Valley, where, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and Pat, you know, uh, Laura said it's, it's okay with us. She'd like to hang around and you listen. So oh, she'll sure. be, yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, so, so that was new business. We'll jump back to clerk's report. I passed out and sent in advance our minutes um, of our last meeting. Mm -hmm. I think Mark will probably entertain a motion to approve them. I will. And I can count on all of you. To... One more to make a motion if you join so the review. Yep. And we need a second? Uh, sure, I second that. All right. Any discussion? Any corrections? Mm -hmm. Comments? It. Yes. 
Do you want to take a roll call before you are? Actually, I think. Do I need a second? Yeah, yes. I did. I did that. Okay. Um, old business follow up on response to the selectly. So I think you all got the email that I sent yes. out this afternoon. Yes. No. That was the letter that um, we drafted up, and I dragged my feet on getting you know, I was I apologize. I just didn't get to it. I didn't get to it until I finally yesterday changed the date on it. Printed it and called her and said, "Can I come bring this to you?" And I uh, actually had a very good meeting with the town administrator. Um, you know, I, I prefaced our letter by saying we are not, you know, the hangman from we're, we're not here to crucify anyone, but we feel that unfortunately this public remark rises to the level that we feel compelled it's mm -hmm. in our mission statement to address this mm -hmm. uh, get clarity on it and if it was not meant as we interpreted it even you know, even if it's not you know this is something that we might want to think about going forward and um the uh town administrator was supportive of that and could cite a number of examples where um, there is uh, the lack of a code of conduct can be uncomfortable for a number of people, whether it's the public speaking to a committee, whether it's a committee talking to a, a head of the department, whether it's committee to committee. Um, and um, so I don't think we'll, we'll bring this to a deaf ear. And um, she put it on her schedule for our next meeting, which is November 17th. So I think she plans to attend mm -hmm. and speak to us. Um, but she was, um, I was preparing to get a defensive posture and I was not, which was very welcome. And um, she also, uh, I said, you know, it would be our goal to help the town work towards being a more civil and welcoming environment. So she's not going to speak to the select board member. Uh, she is. She's going to share the letter with her. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what kind of thing would be? And and <laughs> just need some confrontation. And how that how that plays out i guess we will see um but as we um she was very impressed with how you wordsmith the letter um mm -hmm. again i told her i said we're not coming to link someone but we do want to if this you know we want to avoid this in, in the future we want to um and um, I had another email exchange with her this morning after I got an email back from Pat. Pat had already found a um, this resource of the Massachusetts of the MMA. Uh, um, and the administrator had also found something for the MIIA. Which, uh, um, so there are definitely resources out there and there is a move afoot for more towns to um, adopt a code of conduct which pertains to you know if you're an elected or appointed official and it it goes beyond just meetings and interpersonal it goes to social media and, and email Mm -hmm. And so I think that's hopefully with the support of the support, we will be taking strides to, toward that. And there's a whole training on it. And there, um, um, you know, I said we would be happy to give input if it were mm -hmm. asked. Um, and she thought that that might be acceptable with. She imagined also maybe HR and town council 
to work on putting this code of contact, code of conduct together. So that's retroactive. It doesn't address. No. Yeah. 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 I want to hear about the issue. And I appreciate you actually putting the Pope's. This I've never yeah. seen this. What did she actually write? Mm -hmm. You put that attached to the letter. Oh, yeah. So I'm seeing this for the first time. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because this relates to this presentation. <laughs> no. Right. I think. <laughs> yeah. I I think it was actually yeah. Kayla maybe that that took that took the screenshot and I had actually never seen it. And then I saw it enough because I wanted to have that to back up you know, right. instead of instead yeah. of instead of being hearsay. Right. Oh, so, th this is perfect. Yeah. I it, guess is, it is so egregious. I'm sorry to see that we're going to turn this into an administrative. Now, folks, we shouldn't do that kind of thing. Uh, this woman yeah. could get off well without feeling any kind of pressure. I don't think we can change who she is and what she thinks. Oh, I don't think but we can change who she is. We can influence her behavior. We believe this process to do that. I'm hoping that the the honey works better than this one. Yeah, it usually does. Yeah. That's my hope. Yeah. And I would suggest that in the absence of a written code of conduct, um, it, it, it can be more difficult to mm -hmm. um, resolve this kind of issue. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. you get into conflicts about free speech, right. and yeah. um, so I, I, I personally appreciate this moving forward in a, in a larger way that we can educate each other and um, understand our expectations of each other in the town. I mean, I, I, that's what I hope for out of this. Mm -hmm. That maybe you know I tend to be very optimistic in general, but maybe this is an opportunity for us to really examine this kind of thing and um, have open conversations and, and a um, protocol and, and protocol about expectations of leadership. We have them in other areas. We all went through training on other areas yeah. and all those people are conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. That's right. Take the only and get the, yeah, the mm -hmm. board to decision. Well, the, the letter here that we, we wrote said that Given the public comment lacks context, we would like to ask the select board member for clarification. Are we are we doing that? Yeah, that is what I think she will she will take this to that person and then determine if that if there's going to be any contrition or explanation or not, and then bring that back to us is my hope. I didn't. Uh, I I didn't. Um... To me, that's what's the central issue. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Is to it, it, right. explain, you know. So you know when you when you say, and since we got more here, well, right. I'd like to we, address the, the concerns yeah. that we made. I mean, this yeah. state. I'm just going to say it to remind us. Yeah. They want to redevelop the mall into apartments and all kinds of stuff. Molly on affordable housing, which means more crime, more crap in town. <laughs> and then, and then there's it just says Amherst Chamber of Commerce, and I don't know what that's about. But someone then replies, "We don't need to be another Amherst or Northampton." Mm -hmm. I'd like to know just what that means. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I, I would. That's what I, I want to know. What what is what is that all about? I. <laughs> And not looking to dispel or quell your rage. <laughs> I, it's not rage. It's no, a, it's I just want to be accountable. Yeah, yeah. I just want to know said. what that means. If she were to say something like, "Well, the statistics show that in Amherst and Northampton, where there's housing with low-income people, there's more police calls." Okay, she's just she's she may say that. I'm just giving facts. Yeah. I, I I just would be interested well, in. But we're going to get a response. Anyway, we're getting yeah. recorded, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm also thinking of the uh, Loretta Ross calling in mm -hmm. uh, idea um, that mm -hmm. in a lot of situations, you get farther not by confronting somebody in a you're wrong and I need to change you attitude. You get more by saying, so. What are you saying? You know, what, what makes you say that? Right. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? Do you really think that would happen? Is that what happens in other places? 
they're sort of drawing them out. Um, I'm not yeah. saying I'm skilled at that, but yeah. um, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, thanks exactly. for doing that. Yeah. Draw out what did what what were you yeah. thinking about? Okay. Okay. Well, we can address that when you know, get into it a week yeah. before Thanksgiving. Right. And maybe we'll hear something before then, hopefully. But definitely, it's a more um, expected feedback yes. on that. Okay. Um, at the next meeting? Yes. At the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, time check. Do you need to go? Just a time check for you. Yeah. I don't know what else we need to do. Um, okay. Any other thoughts on, on that issue that you want to share in this public meeting? <laughs> um, read B is viewing the film gather. I think we already kind of touched on that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just share a handout that I shared. Oh, great. First of all, I want to say thank you to Sarah and to Wayne for coming. Um, I think it was good I bought a few more handouts. Mm -hmm. um, that I passed out at the event. Oh, nice. Um, we had 14 people in attendance. Oh, nice. And we received good feedback, including requests to do another movie oh. um, during the movie matinee on an educational topic. Oh, nice. Wow. So, and we even oh, have a date in um, in January that we could use if we wanted to do something for the King holiday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very very perfect. See that movie. That movie is so powerful. Well, for the public watching um, the Zoom, the movie is titled Gather, and it's available through the library, through the yep. Canopy yep. platform, and you can also see it on Netflix. Do you know how many people saw it remotely? I don't think it, we actually showed it remotely. Oh, um, we, we actually accessed it through the, the Canopy platform and mm -hmm. the library subscription. Well, I hardly remember. Uh, we're, uh, recommend that those anybody listening see this movie, which is available in the library. The name of it is Gather. Gather, Gather. and Gather. it has its own film website at www.gather.com. It's an mm -hmm. amazing. Right movie. about uh, food, food sovereignty in Native yes. American communities. It's, yeah. it's very powerful. Very moving. And it was wonderful. You know, big thank you to the Senior Center for co-sponsoring yeah. with us and the library for course. having this. Streaming service and um, and it was a really nice partnership and we'll do it again. Yeah, we'll do yeah. it again. Yes. Yeah, so we should all be thinking job. about what movies that might be available to show in January yes. to recognize the Yeah, this is great. Great report. Um, then before we've done new business, so we go to open agenda. Jumping, I will share my latest experience. I don't have a lot of time for a lot of things, but I have uh, on Audible, I had purchased the audiobook for the 1619 project, and I've been listening to that, and it is it's good to know. It's not comforting to know, it's very upsetting, right. but it's Burying our heads in the sand is not the answer. You're not going to make any any way. It's just um, it, it's hard to deny the systemic racism and you know, she talked about the red line and just the levels that it's economically uh, and 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 how it's still codified mm -hmm. um, that slavery is still legal in a number of states with a loophole that if you commit a crime mm -hmm. slavery is accepted you know there are i think i read that there's a, a dozen or more states this year trying to make a referendum to get, or whatever to get it off their, yeah. their constitutions it's um just because we don't know about it or we turn our faces away is not you know, for the, you know I, I think of the education that I was getting growing up in white New Jersey in a public school and it was you know my takeaway was 
1865, we ended slavery, and everything's been good. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, anything but. So I find that I'm, I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1988, and um, I could be, I could walk the streets in my neighborhood and never see a person of color. Even though two streets over from my house there was an old village, mm -hmm. I knew that those people were there. The whole community there. But I could ride the bus and never see them. And then somebody got on the back of the bus. And mm -hmm. I had a godmother who made me aware. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have you know, not known at all. Mm -hmm. I did so much about it. Mm -hmm. That sort of haunts me now. Mm -hmm. I was raised in that time. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear. Mm -hmm. My godmother asked me once, uh, so when it's 11 year old or 20 year old, you and your buddies go downtown Atlanta on Saturdays and hang out. You go to a movie, you go in the stores, and when you get thirsty, you go and sit down at Woolworths and have a coke and book. What if you were a young black woman? With a baby, where would you sit down and have a baby? Where would you go down? Blew my mind. Where would you go down? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's haunting me now. Yeah. And in a way that I'm not very hopeful about us solving. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a different situation, but it still has that name to it. And there are still people who defend that. Well, it's just one of the reasons I'm on this case. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, but I'm not too well. Okay. Oh, don't apologize. Um, well, really, next meeting. Go ahead. A new business that I would want to suggest is that we be aware of whatever the timeline is for getting a page into the town report. It gets handed out at the spring town meeting. Yeah, so that's January, or February, whatever. Whatever that out. pipeline yeah. is, we yeah. need to know what. What's the deadline? We can ask it for next time. And, and for open agenda, yeah. I suggest we think about having a guest at okay. meetings. I thought this was excellent. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. loved yes. it. At least every other, if not yeah. every. Oh yeah. yeah. I learned a lot from our first set of guests. Oh, no. Yeah. We had the school yeah. superintendent. I love that. And the yeah. police chief. And the police chief. Yeah. Those were Katie, very uh, Annie McKenzie. Yeah. yeah. All those were great. Yeah. And one last open agenda. I would, I, I would toss out there is letterhead. We should yeah. come up with a letter because I didn't know. I kind of added, I, I, I ad libbed on that letter that I sent you. I was like, oh, I'll just do a little. Kind of came a rainbow with the spelling of it. Yeah. Good. Good. Well done. It was good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Look at that. It's in different colors. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. I, chose, I like that. I chose not to do yellow because you wouldn't see it. You but, did do yellow. Well, it's orange. It was orange, but it came out kind of yellow. So, it looks yeah. okay, though. Yeah. Because that's one of those in between. Next meeting is when November is 17th, mm -hmm. one week before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. I appreciate that this got moved because I wouldn't have been able to make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to just get my tablet to listen to the um, discussion mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a meeting Thursday. Yeah. This Thursday is a yeah. um, uh, uh, special time. Yeah. I'm going to try, try and be there because I'm yeah, being the planning board member of the CPA committee. One of the big things was well, the school asked for a huge, I saw that. Um, the a huge request, which we can afford. And we actually had uh, some innovative ways to make that happen so we're not wiped out next year some new interesting project comes along mm -hmm. but i would imagine there will be there will be pushback so mm -hmm. yeah.
Well, I was on the climate change committee, so I've been watching what they're doing. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Somebody wrote something. In. I went to so, the meeting that they had. Yeah, Mr. Fiden wrote a very. Uh, yeah, that just. Outspoken. Uh, and I. That was this morning's paper, wasn't it? That was today's. Yeah. It, it's just that that's. I get frustrated when people put in print things that aren't true. I just have yeah. a lot of time with that. Um, I mean, and I understand your, free your speech, letters. but you're also free to, to speak on truths. But, um, but sometimes we don't know all the facts, so I could probably be saying something in truth. Well, that's right. why I think it's on the so, opinion page, because it's, it's, not, it's not fact checked. That's true. I'm hoping somebody, somebody else writes something that shows up tomorrow. Anyway. Anything else? Thank you, John. This is good. Yeah. Second. Second. All in favor? Four.